Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Ground Rounds. Today we have a special guest who's going to talk to us about GI and molecular diagnosis, someone who I know very well. And before I introduce him, I always like to start Ground Rounds by giving you a little bit of history. So kind of remind us that uh, where we are today in medicine uh, is because of uh, those who came before us. So just a reminder that on 1955 on this day was the death of Albert Einstein. It was also the death in 1802 of Erasmus Darwin, who was the grandfather of Charles Darwin, who was a naturalist and must have somehow influenced how Charles Darwin thought about evolution, because he, he was thinking about that as well. But it's interesting that today was the birth, back in 1905, of George Herbert Hitchins. I didn't know about this man, but it was an incredible, accomplished American pharmacologist who obtained uh, or would share the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology with two colleagues in 1988 for a number of drugs that he developed. Think about this. In 1950s, he developed thioguanin and sigmercoptopurin for the treatment of leukemia. In 57, he developed azathioprine, Imuran, that many of us use for a number of disorders. Allopurinol, pyrimethamine, trimethamine, and even acyclovir. So don't forget about that name. George Herbert Hitchens was born on this day back in 1905. But today is about molecular diagnosis. So I can't uh, leave without forgetting Joseph Goldstein, who was born back in 1940 and with Michael Brown um, was obtained, obtained the uh, Nobel Prize in 1985 for his work on cholesterol. He's a molecular uh, geneticist and is involved very much in molecular diagnosis as it relates to cholesterol-related disorders. So with that, I'll leave you with uh, Dr. Craig McLean, who's going to introduce our guest speaker of the day. Thanks, Jesse. It's a, a real pleasure to have uh, Kurt Hagedorn here today as a visiting professor and our grand round speaker. Uh, Kurt uh, received his MD degree from Washington University. He did his cancer training at the NCI and his GI fellowship uh, back at Barnes. And I think Luis Marsano knew him back then. Uh, he then went to Emory where he was there for about 10 years, was the acting division director, and actually he and Dr. Roman had laboratories close to one another at that time. He was recruited to the University of Kansas to uh, build their GI section, and he did a wonderful job of that. And then uh, more recently he moved on to Utah to build their section, which he's done a great job of. And uh, I've known Kurt for about 20 years, and uh, I'm always amazed that somebody can uh, maintain a research program in two different areas, and he's successfully done that. So he does liver disease and hepatitis C, which he's not talking about today, but uh, what he is talking about is uh, molecular diagnostics uh, and uh, cancer. And so we're uh, pleased to have uh, Kurt here, and uh, let's give him a round of applause. Uh, let me let me turn this on, and if it's too loud, uh, say something. And if you can't hear in the back of the room, please raise your hand. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, what I'd like to is this too loud back there or not? It's okay. All right. Uh, what I like to share with you today is uh, an example of, of some of the new things we can do using sequencing, well, first of all, patients, sequencing, and informatics. But let's first talk about a patient. So this is a patient who's a 50-year-old man with mild COPD at a 20-pack year history of smoking. He stopped about seven to 10 years ago. No other known major illnesses. His father had colon cancer at about age 68. And he comes in, gets a screening colonoscopy. He has several polyps that are less than five millimeters in diameter. I uh, hear photographs of them. Uh, they're located in the sigmoid and transverse colon. Um, the prep for the colonoscopy was okay, but not perfect. So. Um, 
there's always always a question that you you might miss some small polyps. So the endoscopist's impression was a diagnosis of hyperplastic polyps. Uh, the pathology report, these, these two polyps were biopsied and sent to the pathologist, uh, verified this diagnosis of hyperplastic polyps. And the recommendation was return in 10 years. You really have um, no significant risk. These polyps are hyperplastic polyps. are not at risk of becoming colon cancer. So what is the clinical outcome? The clinical outcome is, and this happens pretty often, uh, the patient sort of forgot about this 10-year screening colonoscopy. And about 12 years later, um, he developed some, some GI bleeding. He had a colonoscopy that showed a right-sided colon cancer. Um, surgery, surgery pa surgical path showed involvement of the nodes. So I want you to keep this patient in mind, and we'll come back to this at the end of this uh, presentation. So if, if we think strategically regarding what are some of the things that modern medical centers um, in, in both clinical departments and the scientists in our different departments might be able to do that really impact patient care in major ways, uh, I, I, I'd like to just point out what, what I think are some of the really big things that have impacted patient care. And these were mostly done by chemists and, and in some cases, mathematicians, and in other cases, molecular biologists. So Dorothy Hodgkins in 1969 solved the, the molecular structure of the insulin molecule. This really opened the door to understanding proteins and enzymes in three dimensions in molecular structure. Took her 35 years to do this. She worked on this for 35 years. But this was really the, the opening to starting to do structure-based drug design, which actually has allowed us to develop all kinds of new treatments for hepatitis C that are coming into the clinics now. Gene cloning, um, uh, Boyer and Conan Boyer, so this resulted in recombinant proteins, insulin growth factor, factor VIII, the hepatitis B vaccine that is now preventing hepatoma and chronic hepatitis B uh, throughout many parts of the world, A huge impact on health care. Um, direct structure uh, determination of, of um, drugs and proteins by crystallography. Uh, these folks, Hoffman was a mathematician, Carl was a chemist. Uh, so what took Dorothy Hodgkins 35 years to do could now be done by a relative amateur within weeks. So determining molecular structures now gets done in weeks. Uh, actually, some of their first work was in the 1950s. Uh, it wasn't applied in, in large scale until the 80s. Transgenics. Uh, Mouse knockout models, we can now go ahead and study genes and mechanisms of disease, test new, new drugs and animal models. The human genome and information sciences. So there's been a lot of discussion, well, how has the human genome really helped us regarding patient care? And the two examples that I'll talk about uh, over the next 45 minutes actually are examples that are very much dependent on the human genome. And information sciences, uh, we've, we've real, this has advanced rapidly in a number of areas, both in mining clinical data, all the data we have in EPIC or other electronic medical records, but also in analyzing all this sequencing information. So what I would like to suggest is one of the areas where clinical departments and in, in our basic science departments can work together is actually in applying information sciences and basically new sequencing in human genome um, knowledge um, to study in cohorts of patients to, to better diagnose patients, better stratify them, and select them for, for expensive and complicated and potentially toxic therapy that only benefits a subset of patients. Too often now we we treat you know, everyone with a, a, an agent that is very expensive and toxic. We can't necessarily select the ones that will benefit uh, 
by, by these treatments. So what about all these mouse models that we use to study disease? There was an interesting paper in PNAS by a large group, and this is another thing. Big consortiums are, are, are the ones that really are solving big problems. It's, it's rarely a single individual. And this studied a variety of different uh, stimuli for inflammatory response in humans and in mice. And it turned out that the mouse models really were not very, not, not close at all to human models in many ways. So this study really supports um, a higher priority for translational medicine research, where we focus more on um, using, studying patients for complex human conditions. Once you get that information, then maybe you can make a better mouse model to do particular studies. So what are some examples where sequencing and uh, genomics has really had an impact on patient care? Uh, we're, we're, this, this, we, this has just started, so it's really just started, but there are some good examples. I would say that large B cell lymphoma is an excellent model. So this was done by a group at NCI in the metabolism branch, Lou Stout and his colleagues. So it was known for a number of years that large B cell lymphoma could have two different pathways. One was an indolent course, another was an aggressive course. If you gave that lymph node biopsy to the pathologist, uh, they would look identical, and you couldn't separate those two groups of patients. Uh, the, the, the patients with the aggressive form, you'd like to treat them right away. The patients with the indolent form, you watch them. They may not really have aggressive disease for another decade. If you give that patient chemotherapy, you're basically causing uh, a lot of illness unnecessarily and, and providing an expensive uh, uh, therapy that's not necessary. So by doing gene expression analysis of these large B-cell lymphomas, they were able to separate these two groups very uh, at the time of diagnosis. And this has really enabled these two um, groups of patients with large B-cell lymphoma to be separated and treated appropriately. It's also led to new, new treatment paradigms for large B-cell lymphoma. I'm not going to go through the rest of these, but uh, ocular melanoma is another example. There was a, and this is an example where people taking care of patients can have a huge impact on, on the next level of, um, of, of care and improving care. So this was uh, an ophthalmologist who basically uh, cataloged in freezers um, uveal melanomas. These were later analyzed by uh, gene expression analysis, and a gene expression panel was, was identified that predicted the patients who are at low risk and high risk for recurrent uh, uveal or ocular melanoma. Uh, similar types of tests are being developed for breast cancer and colon cancer. In the GI world, we need uh, better diagnostics and prognostics for chronic hepatitis. Fatty liver is a huge one that we need this to predict the patients that have simple steatosis that are at high risk of developing fibrosis, cirrhosis, and hepatoma. Um, Barrett's esophagus is another one. So over the, uh, what, what I'll be talking about next is really how do we better analyze biospecimens? What are some of the challenges in analyzing biospecimens from patients who have been carefully uh, um, phenotyped? Um, and I'd like to give two examples. One is in liver disease, and the other one is in colon cancer, the serrated polyp problem. Um, the, we, those of us who, who do clinical studies with uh, patient samples are aware of a lot of these problems with sample annotation. A lot of times you have biopsies that are frozen in a tissue bank, right? but you have very little information regarding the patient. You know, you have their, it's a man and they're 55 years old and they have diagnosis X, but it's not linked with detailed clinical information. So this is one of the challenges in doing these types of studies.
Another is collection and storage and isolation of quality biomolecules, for example, RNA, to do analysis. So I would like to um, uh, touch on, on some, of, some of this business of biospecimens. Now, there, there's been a lot of discussion about this ENCODE project, which is the next level of the human genome where they, it's been described in more detail. And one of the surprises was that these regions that were thought to be silent DNA or so-called junk DNA, and that's about 95% of the human genome, um, really aren't silent. That probably on the order of 50% of, of, of the human genome, all this DNA is being transcribed and making RNA molecules. And they don't always encode proteins as, as we were taught in school. They're not encoding proteins. Many of them encode regulatory RNAs, and these regulate gene expression and, and, and a whole variety of biological processes. So big deal. Who cares about this if I'm in clinic and worried about taking care of a sick patient? Well, it actually means that we have many more um, potential biomarkers to stratify patients and, and some of these may indeed be uh, regular, may, may be therapeutic targets. There's a great example in the hepatitis C world where one of these turns out to be a therapeutic target, and that's this MIR-122 that the hepatitis C virus requires for replication. And there have been beautiful clinical studies recently showing that if you have this specific type of nucleotide that um, binds that and sequesters this small RNA that you downregulate virus replication and the virus has a very hard time of becoming resistant to it, unlike small molecule drugs. Um, so these things may not only be um, molecular markers or diagnostics and prognostics, but some of them can be therapeutic targets. So what about this business of analyzing RNA in biopsy specimens. One of the challenges is RNA is relatively unstable. It decays rapidly. And this is an outline of the degradation pathway for, for RNA. So when we want to isolate RNA and analyze it from a biopsy, we use this poly-A tail that's on most messenger RNAs. Um, we, we bind this to another molecule, oligo-DT, and pull down the RNA. But the problem is, is that when RNA de degrades or decays, uh, it decays from this 3' prime end to the 5' prime end, and you lose this poly-A end. So one of the potential problems in analyzing gene expression in RNA in biopsy specimens is that you've lost this poly-A end, and that when you go to recover the RNA, you're only, you're only getting a small subset of the RNA. So we actually wanted to address this in, in liver specimens um, that, that we had collected in the OR and froze immediately in liquid nitrogen um, and, and see how much of a problem is this. It, is this loss of the poly A end or the three prime end a real problem in some sample processing? And the way we did that was we took um, a, a neat method that uh, we developed by studying this RNA binding protein that binds the five prime cap of RNA. We pulled down the RNA from specimens and then sequence the RNA, and then basically look to see if there were sequence missing at the three prime end. And here are the results with liver specimens. So these are liver specimens that are snap frozen in liquid nitrogen, and then thawed for relatively short periods of time. So five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, the, the RNA that's pulled down was sequenced, and we compared the number of reads in the three prime end to the five prime end. And <clears throat> if you look at this, um, um, so if the requirement is to have 50% or more of the RNAs to have their three prime end intact, um, at five minutes, you've lost 30%, approximately 30%. 
and at 10 minutes, you've lost over 80% of the three prime ends in the transcripts. So if you use standard methods to look at gene expression, in the sample handling of a frozen biopsy specimen, after 10 minutes, you've lost over 80% of the information. You won't even see it. So this was scary. I've actually presented this at a National Cancer Institute meeting that's targeted on biospecimen analysis. So here's the good news, though. So I thought the best way of collecting these samples in the clinics were to freeze samples in liquid nitrogen and then recover them later and analyze them. If you put them, if you collect them fresh, don't freeze them, and just put them directly in an RNA preservative, there's much less degradation, even if you let them sit at room temperature for 5 or 10 minutes. So there's something about freezing the sample and then thawing it where all the cells are breaking apart that really turn on RNA decay. So why is this important? It's important regarding how you store samples to do these types of studies. And we actually applied this in our studies, several of our studies. We used this information to collect samples so that we wouldn't be losing 30, half, or 80% of the information when we were looking for biomarkers. So I am going to talk a little bit about hepatitis C and then sessile serrated polyps. So hepatitis C is a huge problem. About 3% of the world's population has chronic hepatitis C. We have well over 3 million people in the U.S. It's about half of liver transplants are due to chronic hepatitis C. And this is a virus. This is a causative agent. It's an RNA virus, a plus-stranded RNA virus. That means this behaves like a messenger RNA. It gets translated and made into a large protein that then gets clipped into different pieces. And a model for this would be poliovirus. Poliovirus has a similar process where the RNA gets directly translated and made into a polyprotein. So this has been pretty amazing how it seems like it's gone slowly, but if you compare this to other problems, we've come up with many new therapeutics rather quickly. So we have protease inhibitors that are now being used and approved by the FDA. One of the problems is the virus becomes resistant to them very quickly. We have polymerase inhibitors now in clinical trials and other direct-acting antivirals. So it looks like our therapies are rapidly improving. We could be from the standard of care a couple years ago of a year of treatment and maybe 30 to 50 percent clearance of virus cure rates to now 95 percent rates with just 12 weeks of treatment. Those are phase three clinical trials. There's still a lot of challenges. And one of the things is we really understand little about what are the drivers of chronic inflammation and hepatocarcinogenesis in chronic hepatitis C. You know, there have been a lot of studies done regarding analysis of liver specimens from patients with chronic hepatitis C. And some of the thinking has been that the inflammatory signals are originating primarily from the virus-infected cell. There have been other theories that the drivers of inflammation are originating from stellate cells, these specialized cells that produce lots of high-density collagen once they're injured. Other possible sites for the drivers of inflammation include these endothelial cells, hepatic sinusoidal endothelial cells, which are actually specialized endothelial cells. They're different than peripheral vascular endothelial cells. They actually process antigens and are thought to be quite different than peripheral vascular endothelial cells. And then Kupfer cells. 
Kupfer cells, tissue fixed macrophages that we've all learned about in our histology courses. Actually, if you count up all the macrophages in, in, a, in a human, it's some, something on the order of 80% or more of the macrophages in your body are probably tissue fixed macrophages in the liver. So this, is, this, this accounts for a huge number of macrophages. And they sit right in the vascular space and um, um, a colleague at University of Washington Immunology Department was studying the role of a model macrophage. It turns out that they're called IPS1 uh, cells um, in, in, the, in inflammation stimulated by hepatitis C. So the virus only replicates within hepatocytes, um, but the virus is endocytosed by macrophages and there's, there, there are a lot of inflammatory signals that originate from these macrophages in plastic, in cell culture. So one of the questions was, does this have anything to do with inflammation occurring in patients with hepatitis C? That model system, did it have anything to do with patients? So there was some data showing that during chronic hepatitis C that IL-1 beta is increased during chronic hepatitis C. They weren't huge changes, but uh, those of you who are tuned into rheumatoid arthritis, IL-1 beta is a huge player in driving inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the dermatologists know that IL-1 beta is a major driver of inflammation during uh, psoriatic uh, skin disease. You know, is it a player in chronic hepatitis C or other chronic inflammatory liver diseases? So what we decided to do is to apply RNA sequencing as a measure of gene expression. So this is a much more sensitive way of measuring gene expression in biospecimens. Uh, it gives much more detail than classic gene array studies that have been done in so many oncological studies. And the way this is done is you isolate the RNA and then you fragment it into different pieces and you prepare a sequencing library and then you sequence this. And you can see, so the sequencing technologies have advanced really rapidly uh, the cost of these have gone down dramatically. Um, and what, what happens with this data, the sequence data, is that you align it with the human genome and then can count up the different sequencing reads with different genes. And one of the advantages is you not only align sequencing reads to well-known genes, but you can also align them to, to regions that are not annotated and identify these, these non-coding RNAs. So you can identify in pathologic specimens these new RNAs that are regulatory. So we decided to apply this to the analysis of both the macrophages exposed to hepatitis C and to biopsies of patients with chronic hepatitis C. And this was the surprise. So here are the Here's a model system in plastic exposed to hepatitis C, and here's a, the analysis of liver biospecimens that are chronically infected with hepatitis C. And this isn't all genes that are differentially expressed, but it, it is genes that are in the major pathways that were up, upregulated. And there was huge overlap between the macrophages in the model system and and chronic HCV infected liver biospecimens. So this was when, when our colleague Mike Gale saw this, Mike was going, whoa, this is incredible. You know, I can't believe how much overlap there is here. Uh, so one of the questions was, well, is, is, is um, the inflammatory response driven by HCV and macrophages really playing an important role in driving inflammation and in chronic hepatitis C infection. So if you start analyzing this data in more detail, it turns out and you look at all the di differentially expressed genes and mild HCV, so this is HCV infection, no fibrosis, um, HCV infection with cirrhosis, <clears throat> and these are the model 
um, macrophages. Uh, we, we've done this more recently with uh, Cooper cells that are isolated from organ explants. Um, so it has been done with true Cooper cells. And if you look at some of these green, some of these areas, so red is upregulated. There's this wedge-shaped expansion of a whole set of genes here that gets progressively um, more increased as you go from mild, severe, to the cells exposed to HCV. And within this group, there are a whole variety of inflammatory cytokines, and IL-1-beta is one of them. And IL-1-beta was increased at least 20-fold in the biospecimens from patients. So um, this, this data is being mined further, but IL-1-beta was definitely a player in this. Um, so uh, one of the other questions was, well, what is the source of that IL-1-beta? And to answer that question, what was done was to do immunocytochemistry of biopsy specimens of liver in patients with <coughs> chronic hepatitis C. And um, this, this is the key figure right here. So this is staining of IL-1-beta. This is a Kupfer cell. It also stains with a, a marker CD68 that uh, is found only in Kupfer cells in the liver. There is some staining in the liver cells, uh, but it turns out that the IL-1-beta is, is produced in a uh, pro form. So similar to insulin, you have to clip it before it gets secreted. And <clears throat> the IL-1-beta in the hepatocytes is not getting clipped and released. So this is additional evidence that IL-1-beta is being produced in Cooper cells in patients with chronic hepatitis C, and that this is, um, this is likely to be a major driver of inflammation in chronic HCV. Now, I'm not going to go over all the data that support this, but this is the model. And um, this is the work from Mike Gale's uh, group in Seattle that shows that basically what is the, the mechanism that's driving the production of IL-1 beta in, in macrophages is that HCV gets ingested in these endosomes, broken down, and it's a very specific structure in the HCV RNA that binds to toll-like receptor 7, induces a cascade of events that turns on the IL-1 beta gene. You get more messenger RNA, more protein, and then there's a second step that occurs that the virus triggers, and that is activation of this NLRP3 inflammasome that then clips the uh, pro-IL-1 beta. You get active IL-1 beta being released from macrophages, and this then drives inflammation uh, locally. So, um, so it turns out that we think that chronic hepatitis C infection and inflammation driven in chronic HCV infection may have many more things in common with other well-studied inflammatory diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and another thing is regarding the um, high incidence of hepatoma in chronic hepatitis C. One of the, one of the questions is, why, why do these patients get such a high incidence of hepatoma? It's a huge problem in our HCV patient population. Well, it turns out that IL-1-beta is very much um, a pro-oncogenic uh, stimulus. And, and one of the interesting puzzles, actually, regarding hepatoma in chronic hepatitis C is we usually don't see hepatoma until you get cirrhosis. Hepatitis B, we see hepatoma in the absence of cirrhosis. So in a study that I'm not going to describe here, we actually looked at what HCV does to, to hepatocytes acutely, and it turns on a lot of pro-oncogenic genes very early on. So one of the things that may be operating in this hepatoma formation in chronic HCV is that you need a change in the matrix proteins and that uh, you know, cell death pathways and other pathways that protect us from, from cancer may be operating, um, but then they don't operate so well once you get all this 
collagen and other matrix proteins, and, and somehow that protects these cells that have pro-oncogenic genes turned on. Um, so um, the, the conclusion is, is basically Cooper cells are, are major players here in driving chronic HCV infection, and I've pretty much discussed this. Um, but this is, I found, you know, Google Images is just wonderful in getting uh, a graphics that you don't have to go and, and design yourself. And, and this, was, this was a great graphic of, of liver showing all the um, uh, microanatomy in cells. Uh, so, so we really think that stellate cells aren't the major source of driving inflammation, that they, they may be involved in, in one of the targets of all the cytokines that are released by Cooper cells. Uh, so there's, there are a lot of questions still that remain. One of the questions is, uh, can this inflammasome actually be a target for antifibrotics? Um, that's, that's, that's one of the uh, products of this, this study. So I'd like to switch now to um, another disorder that's a pre-malignant disorder. Uh, it is thought to account for approximately 30% of colon cancer. And it's this topic of serrated colon polyps. So everyone's heard about adenomatous polyps. This is the polyp that APC mutations are, are playing a major role in driving um, oncogenesis. And it counts for, we, we know quite a bit about these. We don't know everything about them. It turns out that retinoic acid metabolism is very important in these polyps in driving oncogenesis. It's not just APC mutations, but there are these other polyps called serrated polyps, and there are two different types of them. One is hyperplastic polyps, and we see these all the time during screening colonoscopy. And another is a, generally what's a flatter polyp, and it's, these, these are called sessile serrated adenoma polyps. Um, the, the, the World Health Organization that named these couldn't decide whether or not to call them adenomas or, or polyps. They usually don't have dysplasia. Adenoma is usually used to indicate dysplasia. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'm going to call them SSPs in the rest of the discussion. So one of the problems is that if you biopsy this polyp and you biopsy this polyp and give it to a pathologist, there's a high inner observer error rate in identifying SSPs as compared to hyperplastic polyps. They look very similar histologically. Uh, there, there really is little difference. And we've had, a, even our, our GI pathologist, Mary Bronner, who, who worked with one of the pioneers in GI pathology, when we give her biopsies of these, she'll say, now, wait a second. Is it in the right side of the colon um, or the left side? Um, how big is it? You know, so there's a lot of error in calling uh, just from a, a biopsy, hyperplastic or serrated polyp. So what we wanted to do was apply patient cohorts, sequencing, and informatics to see if we could come up with molecular diagnostics for sessile serrated polyps that would differentiate them from hyperplastic polyps and adenomatous polyps. So here comes patient groups again. And fortunately, Randy Burt, our colon cancer expert at Huntsman Cancer Center, has a cohort of patients that have the serrated polyposis syndrome. And these patients have many of these uh, sessile serrated polyps. And here are some examples. You can see how some of these could be missed. Um, here is a large one. Um, and here is a, a standard H&E pathology uh, of one of these. Um, we were able to go ahead and use the knowledge that we had in collecting samples really carefully to avoid RNA decay, um, utilize these patients, and then utilize our sequencing technologies and informatics to do analysis of these lesions and then a variety of different controls. <clears throat> 
And what we found, so this is a Venn diagram of differentially expressed genes and SSPs. Um, we compared our data to a small microarray study that was done, and using RNA sequencing, this is an example how these new sequencing technologies can come up with many more potentially um, useful uh, molecular diagnostics and more information about what are the genes turned on and turned off in a pre-malignant lesion. So we basically found well over 1,000 more than, than a prior study. <clears throat> and if you compare this, this data to the microarray study, um, we're able to go ahead and detect differences that are much greater. So it turns out with uh, gene array studies, you know, you get lots of genes that are changed two or threefold. When RNA sequencing has a greater dynamic range, you can de detect changes of a hundredfold. So it allows you to sort through all these differentially changed genes in a, in a, in a uh, way where you focus on the ones that are really changed in a major way. So I'd like to give you some examples of, of um, the data. Um, and I'll do that just in a minute after showing you this heat map. So here's the sequencing data for seven SSPs that were carefully reviewed by our pathologists and from well-annotated patients, and seven adenomatous polyps. And another advantage of the RNA sequencing is the changes are so big that you can start off with relatively small numbers of patients. So there is this group of genes that is dramatically increased in SSPs as compared to adenomatous polyps. This is evidence actually that the pathways driving oncogenesis and colon cancer formation in the SSPs actually is quite different. There is overlap, you know, there, there, there are regions that overlap, but there are a number of genes that are very different. And if you start drilling down and looking at specific genes that are highly upregulated in SSPs, um, here are some examples. So this is the kind of data you get. These are the sequencing reads aligned to mucin-17 gene. You see this. So this was over 80-fold increase compared to uninvolved uh, colon biopsies in the patients with the syndrome and the SSPs. And then these are control screening colonoscopy patients with no polyps. There is very little expression of this gene at all <coughs> in, in uh, normal colon. And then what we did is, because the sequencing is sometimes expensive, we've learned how to decrease the price dramatically by doing different things like barcoding samples and um, some other technical things. What we used what we did was to use PCR on additional samples and additional controls like adenomatous polyps to, to verify these results. So these are less than one centimeter polyps and these are greater than one centimeter SSPs. So this gene was highly upregulated. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why mucin-17 might be interesting. You know, when I, when I first saw this, mucin Mucin, I said, oh, you know, that's, that's boring, come on. You know, it sounds like someone has a cold or something. But uh, so here is another, another gene. And these, are, these were all surprises. These are not things that we would have been thinking about. These were total surprises. So this is an immunoglobulin um, gene family, <clears throat> Bsig1. It's membrane bound, it, it, and I'll talk a little bit more about its function. It's, it's one of these tight junction proteins. This was highly upregulated in SSPs. That was verified again by PCR. It's not increased in adenomatous polyps. And the, uh, as an example of how you can go ahead and translate this to, to diagnostics for patients, so this sounds, you know, genetics, genomics, sequencing, informatics. Well, you can take this information now and say, all right, can we take a biopsy that is processed by standard pathology methods 
We put it in formalin, send it to the pathologist, they embed it in, in paraffin, do sections. Can you take that sample that's in our usual workflow and now analyze it and differentiate SSPs from hyperplastic polyps and adenomatous polyps? And here are a few of our examples. So this is immunostaining for V-sig-1 in control colon, normal or uninvolved from the syndromic patients. <clears throat> this is a syndromic SSP, really mark staining, uh, and this is a sporadic SSP. And, and we increase the numbers of samples that were analyzed by using tissue arrays. So 40 to 40 or plus samples from different patients were analyzed on one slide with these tissue arrays. So hyperplastic polyps, you see very little staining, and adenomatous polyps, very little staining. So similar results for mucin-17. It's a different pattern. This is a membrane-bound mucin, little staining in hyperplastic polyps or adenomatous polyps. So interestingly, V-sig is increased in gastric and esophageal carcinomas. This really hasn't been looked at much in colon cancers. Mucin-17 uh, is involved in epithelial repair and is increased in pancreatic cancers. So let's go back to our patient. So if we had had, um, and, and this really needs to be validated in a much larger study. We, you know, we have significant numbers with these tissue arrays, 40 plus patients. Um, if we had had a molecular diagnostic or an immunohistochemical diagnostic for SSPs in that patient, the biopsy would have come back saying this patient has an SSP, um, that he has a risk for cancer. Uh, actually, he should come back for screening colonoscopy in three years rather than 10 years. You know, the patient is informed that they do have a risk, and it totally changes your outcome in, in a serious um, um, bad outcome in, in our particular patient, uh, colon cancer, surgery, and possibly a requirement for chemotherapy in, in an early death. So there, um, there are a number of different problems where these kind of approaches can be applied to. So I'd like to just summarize by uh, uh, stating that we think that IL-1 beta is a major driver of inflammation and in chronic hepatitis C, that it's originating from Kupfer cells. The molecular trigger is actually HCV RNA, a very specific structure that binds to toll-like receptor 7. Um, this, this raises questions regarding the NLRP3 um, inflammasome being a target for antifibrotics. It raises questions that whether or not there are similar mechanisms driving inflammation, cirrhosis, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and hepatoma, and fatty liver disease, alcohol liver disease, or other liver diseases. And I think this um, RNA sequencing of very carefully annotated patients and uh, biospecimens from patients with SSPs is an interesting example of how the human genome sequencing and informatics can really be applied to patient cohorts. So I think, the, the, I think we have a really interesting future regarding the application of the knowledge we've gained from the human genome, advances in sequencing technologies, and advances in informatics in studying a variety of diseases identifying better molecular um, diagnostics that stratify patients, predict their outcome, um, and, and really help us in practical ways in, in uh, deciding on specific <coughs> treatment plans and patient care plans. Um, so I, I think despite many of the challenges that we all talk about, we, we really have incredible opportunities over the next decade or two and I really think this is the area that is, there's huge opportunities. The last 25 years, so much has been done in mouse models. This studying patients directly um, is going to allow us to build better models to do, do specific tests and disease mechanism and therapeutic approaches. So I'd like to acknowledge a, a number of the people that have 
participated and done a lot of this work. Nevin Popic was actually an ID fellow from University of Zagreb. <coughs> um, he is back home writing a thesis on some of this work uh, and is going to be joining the faculty there. Brett McGettigan is a uh, undergrad that actually worked with us who is now an MSTP student at uh, University of Colorado. Uh, Priyanka is one of our GI fellows. She got an ACG fellowship to study sporadic SSPs and is uh, in a, an author on our first paper that we're about ready to submit. Uh, Chris Maxwell is a GI fellow that uh, loved computers um, and actually did a lot of the data analysis. Don Delker is one of our research scientists that has played a critical role in all of these studies. And Amiko Uchida is a medical student that actually worked with us and got so excited about investigation, she applied for one of the uh, Hughes NIH fellowships where they spend a year at, at NIH in an NIH lab between their second and third year of medical school. And uh, she got one of those and has done really interesting work related to um, gut microbiome and inflammation. And Mike Gale, Randy Burt, and Mary Bronner are our faculty colleagues in these. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'd be glad to answer questions. Kurt, th thank you so much. This was excellent. I, I had two comments and a question. All right. The first comment is that uh, Dr. Schaefer, one of the chairs in, in New York, wrote a book called The Vanishing Physician Scientist, and Kurt is an example that the physician scientist is not vanishing. Number two is that translational research is always something that people ask each other, what, what, how do you define translational research? In my mind, translational research is the use of basic science techniques to study clinical samples or patients to address an important clinical question. This, to me, is a classic example of very good, strong uh, translational research that has an impact as you solve their cancer. I guess the question I have relates to gold standards. Uh -huh. You have difficulties in dissociating and defining the two classes of polyps. That is the reason you engage in this <clears> research. <throat> Once you define these differences in gene expression, particularly in this case RNA, you start losing track of which one is the gold standard. Do you follow the morphology or do you follow gene expression? And to me, the gold standard is prospective trial to evaluate if you can predict outcome based on, a, on your new marker. Has that been done? No, we, we haven't done that. So this, this study is just being submitted. Um, uh, and, but now we can diagnose these uh, lesions, patients with these lesions accurately, and we can start doing um, clinical studies to, um, to follow outcomes of the patients. We can start testing uh, chemo prevention agents. I think that it, the, the, the standard is going to be, uh, you know, we, we need to do a validation study, a larger scale validation study, but I think what will happen is that the immunohistochemistry and the gene expression will be the gold standard because the standard H&E pathology is not held up. Even in the hands of someone as good as Mary Bronner, she has a hard time identifying these. So I, I think there are, there are a number of examples um, where you can apply these approaches. I, I, careful, careful problem selection is the key. You know, this type of approach is not going to be useful in every disease, but if we pick diseases similar to this where there, there are difficulties in diagnosis, where a subset of patients might benefit by very expensive, uh, complicated therapies, I think I think we can make huge improvements in patient care. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, SSP story is really quite fantastic how uh, work in a lab can be quickly brought to the clinic uh, and, and put into practice. Uh, the one question I had uh, for you was <clears throat> you, of course, talked about how the right sided SSPs were the ones that were uh, important. Have you looked at uh, what your markers are on the in the uh, in the left sided uh, lesions? So we we have analyzed SSPs that have occurred in the left side. The SSPs generally occur in the right and transverse colon, 
Um, but, uh, you know, preliminary analysis is these, these hold up with SSPs that are in the left side of the colon. Um, and um, it may have sounded like it happened quickly, but I've, you know, we've been working on this for five years. <laughs> and our, our first, um, you know, when we were, the informatics side is advanced incredibly in four to five years. So when we first started doing this analysis of biospecimens that were RNA sequenced, our informatics person who was very good and worked at Affymatrix um, said, well, you know, we can only analyze maybe one or two samples. I said, well, we'd like to, we'd like to analyze a, a 10, 10 samples at least. He said, we, we can't, the data sets are too big. So in a span of about four years, that's dramatically changed. So, um, uh, and, and I'd like to mention that possibly pairing this kind of analysis of biospecimens with um, clinical database uh, analysis uh, um, could be very powerful. There might be simple things like low albumin or, you know, low, low hemoglobin that match with, with, with other diseases. And someone from, I heard someone from Univers Peter Higgins from University of Michigan talk about this not long ago. You know, basically looking for needles in the haystacks of clinical data. Um, and the interesting example was patients with Crohn's disease who come in with bowel obstruction. Can you predict who is at very high risk of perforating and intervene before they perforate? And we give them IV fluids, we make them MPO, we give them steroids, and then we hope that inflammation resolves, they open up, and they don't perf. Some of them perf, they get peritonitis, they get an operation, and they found that low hemoglobin and low albumin were high predictors of, of uh, increased risk for perforation. If you combine that kind of data analysis with possibly biospecimen analysis, maybe whole blood where you, you have macrophages and sentinels there, we might be able to come up with very powerful measures to stratify patients better and decide patient care courses. Kurt, you mentioned that um, you spent quite some time talking about interleukin-1 beta, and I'm always fascinated about the, the lack of specificity. I mean, interleukin-1 beta is present everywhere. And yet, in your case, you focus on the potential for cirrhosis. Uh, what gives it its organ specificity? And then, then you mentioned MUC17. And, yeah. All, yeah. and then is it the ratio of these genes that sort of well, allows one organ to develop one thing and the skin to develop another and the lung to always be healthy? Um, the lung's not always healthy. <laughs> <laughs> and IL-1 beta, I believe, is an important player in lung inflammation. Yeah. So I think there, <clears throat> I, I think, you know, people had reported IL-1 beta to be increased in the serum of patients with HCV chronic hepatitis C, but there were relatively small elevations. And, and I think the thinking was, well, we really don't know if that's important. But if you look at it within the context of the liver, if you're releasing a lot of it locally within the liver, Maybe a lot of it doesn't get out in the serum. Maybe it has a local effect. So I think um, these differentially gene, differential gene expression patterns that are occurring within an organ, you may not necessarily, um, uh, you know, there, there may be differences in, in the pathobiology uh, for different organs, basically. Uh, but the IL-1 beta story is interesting. It, it, it takes away a little bit of the, the mystery of, of hepatitis C inflammation and links it with other inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis. Um, well, Kurt, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank, thank you so much. Sure.